my friends, or bonjour, mes amis. We are going to read The Count of Monte Cristo today. I'm Christina Wainwright, the manager at the Pacific Beach Library, and I'm so glad you're able to join us for another installment of our tea series. This time we are now starting a brand new book, and today's book that we're going to be reading by for the next two months and change will be The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Um, it is an acclaimed, noted story. Um, it is considered one of the most popular and gripping and uh, just like captivating adventure novels of all time. Um, it, it was originally published in France in between 1844 and 1846. It was serially published and so we're kind of continuing in that grand tradition of reading it chapter by chapter, little by little. That was actually how the readers would have gotten it themselves. They weren't able to stay all night binging it. They were themselves reading it little by little as each installment was published. And so we're going to get that experience together reading this serial, serial novel. Um, the County Monte Cristo, for those of you who don't know it, I'm just going to give a little hint because I don't want to give away any big spoilers. But it's a story of adventure, of love, of honor, of hope of revenge, of justice and injustice, um, has a lot of huge themes and I will say this probably many times over the course of the book, it is a very long book and so I suspect it has not just a little of everything under the sun but a lot of everything under the sun and so it's a really really good book. Um, I hope we're gonna all enjoy, if you haven't read it before I hope you fall in love with the book too. If you have read the book please comment and let us know. I'm always curious to know when we're reading these read-alouds together, is this your first time reading the book? Have you read it before and you're going back to an old favorite? Or maybe maybe it's something that you read in school and you just couldn't get into it then, but now as an adult you're coming back to it and it's a totally different experience. It's just different when we, you know, we encounter books at different points in our lives, and I always think that's fun to see like how a book will impact us. At various stages. So I'd be curious if you don't mind commenting um, just to let us know. Is this your first time reading the book? Have you read it before? And what did you think of it the first time around if you'd read it before? In honor of this French book by Alexandre Dumas, um, today's tea is the Bourbon Vanilla. Especially too, this book is set during the Bourbon Restoration in France and so it seemed appropriate to have a bourbon tea. And in fact, I'm wondering if I should keep calling it bourbon tea or if I should go with a more French pronunciation. Again, I've warned y'all before about my various attempts at accents and voices. I did study French in junior high and I think one or two years of high school. I am not very good at it. I don't remember very much of it. But I do remember that there was a history teacher at my school who spoke fluent French. His name was Mr. de Bourbon, except when he came into French class, in which case he became Monsieur de Bourbon. And so we are having our bourbon vanilla or bourbon vanilla because I don't know how to say vanilla. It's not written here in, in French. <laughs> so um, today our bourbon vanilla tea, which let me just tell you in case you're curious what's in it. It's a rubus tea with rubus, calendula petals, almond slices, and vanilla. So let's go ahead and give that a try. It's a loose leaf tea, so I went ahead and put it in my French press so that we could see that beautiful color and also how the the leaves of the um, the different herbs and whatnot, how they expand when they are steeping. Oh, look at that. It's such a beautiful color. Ooh, that one's hot, but it smells so good. That's delicious. Has that nice vanilla scent to it. Um, really, really good. All right, so I'm still getting a feel for how long each of our chapters are gonna be. I think we're going, to, we're going to start out by reading two chapters today. And so we'll go ahead and let the, let the excitement begin. We're going to start reading The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. All right. And this, for this book, the chapters do have names. So um, we'll start with that. And again, one more time, apologies in advance for the many, many instances in which I'm going to have terribly sad attempts at French accents. I'm, I'm gonna, I'll do my best because <laughs> I enjoy doing the French words. But yeah, it's mainly gonna be a very California version of French. So, um, all right, chapter one, the arrival at Marseille. On the 24th of February, 1815, the lookout of Notre Dame de la Garde signaled the three master, the Pharaon from Smyrna, Trieste, and Naples. As usual, a pilot put off immediately and rounding the Chateau de If, got on board the vessel between Cape Morgion and the Ile de Rion. 
Immediately and according to custom, the platform of Fort St. Jean was covered with spectators. It is always an event at Marseille for a ship to come into port, especially when this ship, like the Pharaon, had been built, rigged, and laden on the stocks of the old Fosse and belonged to an owner of the city. The ship sailed on. It had safely passed the strait, which some volcanic shock has made between the I the eel of uh, Calas Rain and the eel of Jaros, had cleared the island of Pomeg and approached the harbor under topsails, jibs, and foresail, but so slowly and sedately that the idlers, which with that instinct which misfortune sends before it, asked one another what misfortune could have happened on board. However, those experienced in navigation saw plainly that if any accident had occurred, it was not to the vessel herself, for she bore down with all the evidence of being skillfully handled, the anchor ready to be dropped, the bowsprit shrouds loose, and beside the pilot, who was stealing the pharaon into the narrow entrance of the port of Marseille, was a young man, who with an active and vigilant eye watched every motion of the ship and repeated every direction, each direction of the pilot. The vague disquietude which prevailed amongst the spectators had so much affected one of the crowd that he did not await the arrival of the vessel in harbor, but, jumping into a small skiff, desired to be pulled alongside the pharaon, which he reached as she rounded the creek of La Reserve. When the young man on board saw this individual approach, he left his station by the pilot and came, hat in hand, to the side of the ship's bulwarks. He was a fine, tall, slim young fellow, with black eyes and hair as dark as the raven's wing, and his whole appearance bespoke that calmness and resolution peculiar to men accustomed from their cradle to contend with danger. Ah, is that you, Dantes? cried the man in the skiff. What's the matter, and why is there such an air of tragedy aboard? A great misfortune, Monsieur Morel, replied the young man, a great misfortune. For me especially. Off Civita Vecchia we lost our brave Captain Leclerc. And the cargo? inquired the owner anxiously. It is all safe, Monsieur Morel, and I think you will be satisfied on that head. But poor Captain Leclerc. What happened to him? asked the owner, with an air of considerable resignation. What happened to the worthy captain? He died. Fell into the sea? No, sir. He died of brain fever in dreadful agony. Then turning to the crew, he said, Look out there, all ready to drop anchor. The hands obeyed. At the same moment, the eight or ten seamen who composed the crew sprang some to the main sheets, others to the braces, others to the halyards, others to the jib ropes, and others to the topsail brails. The young sailor gave a look to see that his orders were promptly and accurately obeyed, and then turned again to the owner. And how did this misfortune occur? he inquired, resuming the inquiry suspended for a moment. Alas, sir, in the most unexpected manner. After a long conversation with the harbor master, Captain Leclerc left Naples greatly disturbed in his mind. At the end of twenty-four hours, he was attacked by a fever and died three days afterwards. We performed the usual burial service, and he is at rest, sewn up in his hammock with two cannon balls of 36 pounds each at his head and heels, off the island of El Giglio. We bring to his widow his sword and cross of honor. It was worth while, truly, added the young man with a melancholy smile, to make war against the English for ten years and to die in his bed at last, like everybody else. Ah, Edmund, cried the owner, who appeared more comforted at every moment. We are all mortal, and the old must make way for the young. If not, why, there would be no promotion. And as you have assured me that the cargo is all safe and sound, Monsieur Morel, take my word for it, and I advise you not to take less than 1,000 louis for the profits of the voyage. Then as they were just passing the round tower, the young man shouted out, Ready there to lower topsails, foresail, and jib. The order was executed as promptly as if on board a man of war. Let go and braille all. At this last word, all the sails were lowered and the bark moved almost imperceptibly onwards. Now, if you will come on board, Monsieur Morel, said Dantes, 
observing the owner's impatience. Here is your supercargo. Monsieur Danglars, coming out of his out of his cabin, will furnish you with every particular. As for me, I must look after the anchoring and dress the ship in mourning. The owner did not wait to be twice invited. He seized a rope which Dantes flung to him, and with an activity that would have done credit to a sailor, climbed up the side of the ship, whilst the young man, going to his task, left the conversation to the individual whom he had, amount, whom he had announced under the name of Danglars, who now came towards the owner. He was a man of twenty-five or twenty-six years of age, of unprepossessing countenance, obsequious to, to his superiors, insolent to his inferiors, and then, besides his position as responsible agent on board, which is always obnoxious to the sailors, he was as much disliked by the crew as Edmond Dantes was beloved by them. Well, Monsieur Morel, said Danglars, you have heard of the misfortune which has befallen us? Yes, yes, poor Captain Leclerc. He was a brave and an honest man, and a first-rate seaman, grown old between sky and ocean, as should a man charged with the interest of a house so important as that of Morel and Son, replied Danglars. But, replied the owner, following with one eye on Dantes, who was watching the anchoring of the vessel, it seems to me that a sailor needs not be so old as you say, Danglars, to understand his business, for our friend Edmund seems to understand it thoroughly, and not to require instruction from any one. Yes, said Danglars, casting toward Edmund a look in which a feeling of envy was strongly visible. Yes, he is young, and youth is invariably self-confident. Scarcely was the captain's breath out of his body than he assumed the command without consulting anyone, and he caused us to lose a day and a half at the Isle of Elba instead of making for Marseilles direct. As to taking the command of the vessel, replied Morel, that was his duty as captain's mate. As to losing a day and a half off the Isle of Elba, he was wrong, unless the ship wanted some repair. The ship was as well as I am, and as I hope you are, Monsieur Morel, and this day and a half was lost from pure whim, for the pleasure of going ashore, and nothing else. Dantes, said the ship owner, turning towards the young man, come this way. In a moment, sir, answered Dantes, and I'm with you. Then calling to the crew, he said, let go. The anchor was instantly dropped, and the chain ran rattling through the porthole. Dantes continued at his post in spite of the presence of the pilot until this maneuver was completed, and then he added, lower the pennant half-mast high, put the ensign in a weft, and slope the yards. You see, said Danglars, he fancies himself captain already, upon my word. And so in fact he is, said the owner. Except for your signature and your partner's, Monsieur Morel. And why should he not have it, said the owner? He is young, it is true, but he seems to me a thorough seaman and of full experience. A cloud passed over Danglars' brow. Your pardon, Monsieur Morel, said Dantes, approaching. The ship now rides at anchor, and I am at your service. You hailed me, I think? Danglars retreated a step or two. I wish to inquire why you stopped at the Isle of Elba. I do not know, sir. It was to fulfill a last instruction of Captain Leclerc, who, when dying, gave me a packet for the Marshal Bertrand. And did you see him, Edmund? Who? The Marshal? Yes. Morel looked around him, and then, drawing Dantes on one side, he said suddenly, And how is the Emperor? Very well, as far as I could judge from my eyes. You saw the Emperor, then? He entered the marshal's apartment whilst I was there. And you spoke to him? Why, it was he who spoke to me, sir, said Dantes with a smile. And what did he say to you? Asked me questions about the ship, the time it left Marseilles, the course she had taken and what was her cargo. I believe if she had not been laden and I had been master, he would have bought her. But I told him I was only mate and that she belonged to the form of to the firm of Morel and Son. Ah, ah, he said, I know them. The Morels have been ship owners from father to son, and there was a Morel who served in the same regiment with me when I was in garrison at Valence. Pardieu, and that is true, cried the owner, greatly delighted. 
And that was Policar Morel, my uncle, who was afterwards a captain. Dantes, you must tell my uncle that the emperor remembered him, and you will see it bring tears into the old soldier's eyes. Come, come, continued he, patting Edmund's shoulder kindly. You did very right, Dantes, to follow Captain Leclerc's instruction and call at the Isle of Elba. Although, if it were known that you had conveyed a packet to the Marshal and had conversed with the Emperor, it might get you into trouble. How could that get me into trouble, sir? asked Dantes, for I did not even know of what I was the bearer, and the Emperor merely made such inquiries as he would of the first comer. But your pardon, here are the officers of health and the customs coming alongside, said the young man, and the young man went to the gangway. As he departed, Danglars approached and said, Well, it appears that he has given you satisfactory reasons for his landing at Porto Ferrajo? Yes, most satisfactory, my dear Danglars. Well, so much the better, said the supercargo, for it is always painful to see a comrade who does not do his duty. Dantes has done his, replied the owner, and that is not saying much. It was Captain Leclerc who gave orders for this delay. Speaking of Captain Leclerc, has not Dantes given you a letter from him? To me? No. Was there one? I believe that, besides the packet, Captain Leclerc had confided a letter to his care. Of what packet are you speaking, Danglar? Why, what Dantes left at Porto Ferrajo. How do you know he had a packet to leave at Porto Ferrajo? Danglars turned very red. I was passing close to the door of the captain's cabin, which was half open, and I saw him give the packet and letter to Dantes. He did not speak to me of it, replied the shipowner, but if there be any letter, he will give it to me. Danglars reflected for a moment. Then, Monsieur Morel, I beg of you, said he, not to say a word to Dantes on the subject. I may have been mistaken. At this moment, the young man returned, and Danglars retreated as before. Well, my dear Dantes, are you now free? inquired the owner. Yes, sir. You have not been long detained? No. I gave the custom house officers a copy of our bill of lading. As to the other papers, they sent a man off with the pilot to whom I gave them. Then you have nothing more to do here? No. All is arranged now. And then you can come and dine with me. Excuse me, Monsieur Morel, excuse me if you please, but my first visit is due to my father, though I am not the less grateful for the honor you have done me. Right, Dantes, quite right. I always knew you were a good son. And, inquired Dantes with some hesitation, do you know how my father is? Well, I believe, my dear Edmund, though I have not seen, well, I believe, my dear Edmund, though I have not seen him lately. Yes. He likes to keep himself shut up in his little room. Now that proves at least that he is wanted for nothing during your absence. Dantes smiled. My father is proud, sir, and if he had not money enough for a meal left, I doubt if he would have asked anything from any one except God. Well then, after this first visit has been made, we rely on you. I must again excuse myself, Monsieur Morel. For after this first visit has been paid, I have another, which I am most anxious to pay. True, Dantes. I forgot that there was at the Catalan someone who expects you no less impatiently than your father, the lovely Mercedes. Dantes blushed. Ah, ah, said the shipowner. That does not astonish me, for she has been to me three times, inquiring if there were any news of the Faron. Peste. Edmund, you have a very handsome mistress. She is not my mistress, replied the young sailor gravely. She is my betrothed. Sometimes one and the same thing, said, Mi said Morel with a smile. Not with us, sir, replied Dantes. Well, well, my dear Edmund, continued the owner, do not let me detain you. You have managed my affairs so well that I ought to allow you all the time you require for your own do you want any money? No, sir. I have all my pay to take, nearly three months' wages. You are a careful fellow, Edmund. Say I have a poor father, sir. Yes, yes. I know how good a son you are, 
So now haste away to see your father. I have a son too, and I, shall, I should be very angry with those who detained him from me after a three months voyage. Then I have your leave, sir? Yes, if you have nothing more to say to me. Nothing. Captain Leclerc did not, before he died, give you a letter for me? He was unable to write, sir, but he, that reminds me that I must ask your leave of absence for some days. To get married? Yes, first, and then to go to Paris. Very good. Have what time you require, Dantes. It will take quite six weeks to unload the cargo, and we cannot get you ready for sea until three months after that. Only be back again in three months, for the pharaon, added the owner, patting the young sailor on the back, cannot sail without her captain. Without her captain, cried Dantes, his eyes sparkling with animation. Pray mind what you say, for you are touching on the most secret wishes of my heart. Is it really your intention to appoint me captain of the pharaon? If I were sole owner, I would appoint you this moment, my dear Dantes, and say it is settled. But I have a partner, and you know the Italian proverb. Che accompagno a padrone. He who has a partner has a master. But the thing is at least half done, since you have one out of two voices. Rely on me to procure you the other. I will do my best. Ah, Monsieur Morel, exclaimed the young seaman, with tears in his eyes and grasping the owner's hand. Monsieur Morel, I thank you in the name of my father and of Mercedes. Good, good, Edmund. There is a sweet little cherub that sits up aloft that keeps a good watch for good fellows. Go to your father, go and see Mercedes, and come to me afterwards. Shall I row you ashore? No, I thank you. I shall remain and look over the accounts of Danglars. Have you been satisfied with him this voyage? That is according to the sense you attach to the question, sir. Do you mean is he a good comrade? No, for I think he never liked me since the day when I was silly enough, after a little quarrel we had, to propose to him to stop for ten minutes at the Isle of Mont Monte Cristo to settle the dispute a proposition which I was wrong to suggest, and he quite right to refuse. If you mean his responsible agent that you asked me the question, I believe there is nothing to say against him, and that you will be content with the way in which he has performed his duty. But tell me, Dantes, if you had the command of the pharaon, would you have pleasure in retaining Danglars? Captain or mate, Monsieur Morel, replied Dantes, I shall always have the greatest respect for those who possess our owner's confidence. Good, good. Dantes, I see you are a thorough good fellow and will detain you no longer. Go, for I see how impatient you are. Then I have leave? Go, I tell you. May I have the use of your skiff? Certainly. Then for the present, Monsieur Morel, farewell and a thousand thanks. I hope soon to see you again, my dear Ed Edmund. Good luck to you. The young sailor jumped into the skiff and sat down in the stern, desiring to be put ashore at the Canabiere. The two rowers bent to their work, and the little boat glided away as rapidly as possible in the midst of the thousand vessels which choke up the narrow way which leads between the two rows of ships from the mouth of the harbor and the Quai d'Orléans. De Orleans. The ship owner, smiling, followed him with his eyes until he saw him spring out on the quay and disappear into the midst of the throng which, from five o'clock in the morning until nine o'clock at night, choke up this famous street of La Canabière, Canabière, of which the modern Fossen are so proud and say with all the gravity in the world and with that accent which gives so much character to what is said, if Paris had La Canabière, Paris would be a second Marseille. On turning round, the owner saw Danglars behind him, who apparently attended to his orders, but in reality followed, as he did, the young sailor with his eyes. Only there was a great difference in the expression of the looks of the two men, who thus watched the movements of Edmund Dantes. Chapter 2. Father and Son We will leave Danglars struggling with the feelings of hatred and endeavoring to insinuate in the ear of the shipowner, Morel, some evil suspicions against his comrade, and follow Dantes, who, after having traversed the Can Canabiere, took the Rue de Noailles, and entering into a small house situated on the left side of the Allée de Meillan, 
rapidly ascended four flights of a dark staircase, holding the baluster in one hand, whilst with the other he repressed the beatings of his heart and paused before a half-open door which revealed all the interior of a small apartment. This apartment was occupied by Dantes's father. The news of the arrival of the pharaon had not yet reached the old man, who, mounted on a chair, was amusing himself with staking some nasturtions with tremulous hand, which, mingled with clematis, formed a kind of trellis at his window. Suddenly he felt an arm thrown round his body, and a well-known voice behind him exclaimed, Father! Dear father! The old man uttered a cry, and turning round, then seeing his son, he fell into his arms, pale and trembling. What ails you, my dearest father? Are you ill? inquired the young man, much alarmed. No, no, my dear Edmund, my boy, my son. No, but I did not expect you. Enjoy the surprise of seeing you so suddenly. Ah, it really seemed as if I were going to die. Come, come, cheer up, my dear father. It really is me. They say joy never hurts, and so I come to you without any warning. Come now, look cheerfully, look cheerfully at me instead of gazing as you do with your eyes so wide. Here I am back again, and we will now be happy. Yes, yes, my boy, so we will. So we will, replied the old man. But how shall we be happy? Will you never leave me again? Come, tell me all the good fortune that has befallen you. Ah, God forgive me, said the young man, for rejoicing at happiness derived from the misery of others. But heaven knows I did not seek this good fortune. It has happened, and I really cannot pretend to be sorry. Good Captain Leclerc is dead, father, and it is probable that, with the aid of Monsieur Morel, I shall have his place. Do you understand, father? Only imagine me, a captain at twenty, with a hundred louis pay, and a share in the profits. Is this not more than a poor sailor like me could have hoped for? Yes, my dear boy, replied the old man, and much more than you could have expected. Well then, with the first money I receive, I mean you to have a small house, with a garden to plant your clematis, your nasturtiums, and your honeysuckles. But what ails you, father? Are not you well? Ah, tis nothing, nothing. It will soon pass away. And as he said so, the old man's strength failed him, and he fell backwards. Come, come, said the young man. A glass of wine, father, will revive you. Where do you keep your wine? No, no, thank ye. Ye need not look for it. I do not want it, said the old man. Yes, yes, father, tell me where it is. And he opened two or three cupboards. It is no use, said the old man. There is no wine. What? No wine, said Dantes, turning pale, and looking altern alternately at the hollow cheeks of the old man and the empty cupboards. What? No wine? Have you been short of money, father? I want for nothing now you are here, said the old man. Yet, stammered Dantes, wiping the perspiration from his brow, Yet I gave you two hundred francs when I left three months ago. Yes, yes, that is true. But you forgot at that time a little debt to our neighbor, Caderousse. He reminded me of it, telling me that if I did not pay for you, he would be paid by Monsieur Morel. And so, you see, lest he might do you an injury. Well, why, I paid him. But, cried Dantes, it was a hundred and forty francs I owed Caderousse. Yes, stammered the old man. And you paid him out of the 200 francs I left you? The old man made a sign in the affirmative. So that you have lived for three months on 60 francs, muttered the young man. You know how little I required, said the old man. Heaven pardon me, cried Edmund, falling on his knees before the old man. What are you doing? Oh, you have cut me to the heart. Never mind it, for I see you once more, said the old man. And now all is forgotten, all is well again. Yes, here I am, said the young man, with a happy prospect and a little money. Here, father, here, he said, take this, take it, and send for something immediately. And he emptied his pockets on the table, whose contents consisted of a dozen pieces of gold, 
five or six crowns, and some smaller coin. The countenance of old Dantes brightened. Who does this belong to? He inquired. To me, to you, to us. Take it, buy some provisions, be happy, and tomorrow we shall have more. Gently, gently, said the old man with a smile. And by your leave, I will use your purse moderately. For they would say, if they saw me buy too many things at a time, that I had been obliged to await your return in order to be able to purchase them. Do as you please, but first of all, pray have a servant, father. I will not have you left alone so long. I have some smuggled coffee and most capital tobacco in a small chest in the hold, which you shall have tomorrow. Oh, but hush, here comes somebody. "'Tis Caderousse, who has heard of your arrival, and no doubt comes to congratulate you on your fortunate return. "'Ah, lips that say one thing, while the heart thinks another,' murmured Edmund. "'But never mind. He is a neighbor who has done us a service on occasions, so he's welcome.'" As Edmund finished his sentence in a low voice, there appeared at the door the black and shock head of Caderousse. He was a man of twenty-five or twenty-six years of age, and held in his hand a length of cloth, which, in his capacity as a tailor, he was about to turn into the lining of a coat. "'What? Is that you, Edmund? Returned,' said he, with a broad Marseille accent, and a grin that displayed teeth as white as ivory. "'Yes, as you see, neighbor Caderousse, and ready to be agreeable to you in any and every way,' replied Dantes, but ill-concealing his feelings under this appearance of civility. "'Thanks.' thanks. But fortunately, I do not want for anything, and it chances that at times there are others who have need of me. Dantes made a gesture. I do not allude to you, my boy. No, no, I lent you money, and you returned it. That's like good neighbors, and we are quits. We are never quits with those who oblige us, was Dantes's reply, for when we do not owe them money, we owe them gratitude. What's the use of mentioning that? What is done is done. Let us talk of your happy return, my boy. I have got on the quay to find a match for a piece of mulberry cloth when I met friend Danglar. What? You in Marseille? Yes, says he. I thought you were in Smyrna. I was, but am now back again. And where is the dear boy, our Edmund? Why, with his father, no doubt, replied Danglar. And so I came, added Caderousse, as fast as I could to have the pleasure of shaking hands with a friend. Worthy Caderousse, said the old man, he is so much attached to us. Yes, to be sure I am. I love and esteem you, because honest folks are so rare. But it seems you have come back rich, my boy, continued the tailor, looking askance at the handful of gold and silver which Dantes had thrown on the table. The young man remarked the greedy glance, which shone in the dark eyes of his neighbor. Oh, he said negligently, this money is not mine. I was expressing to my father my fears that he had wanted many things in my absence, and to convince me, he emptied his purse on the table. Come, father, added Dantes, put this money back in your box, unless neighbor Caderousse wants anything, and in that case, it is at his service. No, my boy, no, said Caderousse, I am not in any want, thank God. The state nourishes me. Keep your money, keep it, I say, one never has too much. But at the same time, my boy, I am as much obliged by your offer as if I took advantage of it. It was offered with good will, said Dantes. No doubt, my boy, no doubt. Well, you stand well with Monsieur Morel, I hear. You insinuating dog, you. Monsieur Morel has always been exceedingly kind to me, replied Dantes. And then you were wrong to refuse to dine with him. What? Did you refuse to dine with him, said old Dantes. And did he invite you to dine? Yes, father, replied Edmund, smiling at his father's astonishment at the excessive honor paid to his son. And why did you refuse, son? inquired the old man. That I might the sooner see you again, father, replied the young man. I was most anxious to see you. But it must have vexed Monsieur Morel, good worthy man, said Caderousse. And while you are looking forward to being captain, it is wrong to annoy the owner. But I explained to him the cause of my refusal, replied Dantes, and I hope he fully understood it. Yes, 
But to be captain, one must give, a, give way a little to the owners. I hope to be captain without that, said Dantes. So much the better, so much the better. Nothing will give greater pleasure to all your old friends, and I know one down there behind the citadel of St. Nicholas who will not be sorry to hear it. Mercedes, said the old man. Yes, father, and with your permission, now I have seen you and know you are well and have all you require, I will ask your consent to go and pay a visit to the Catalans. Go, my dear boy, said old Dantes, and may heaven bless you and your wife as it has blessed me and my son. His wife, said Caderousse. Why, how fast you go on, Monsieur Dantes. She is not his wife yet, it appears. No, but according to all probability, she soon will be, replied Edmund. Yes, yes, said Caderousse. But you were right to return as soon as possible, my boy. And why? Because Mercedes is a fine, very fine girl, and fine girls never lack lovers. She particularly has them by dozens. Really? answered Edmund, with a smile which had in it traces of slight uneasiness. Ah, yes, continued Caderousse, and capital offers too. But you know you will be captain, and who could refuse you then? Meaning to say, replied Dantes, with a smile which but ill concealed his trouble, that if I were not a captain, eh, eh, said Caderousse, shaking his head. Come, come, said the sailor. I have a better opinion than you of women in general, and of Mercedes in particular, and I am certain that, captain or not, she will always be faithful to me. So much the better, so much the better, said Caderousse. When one is going to be married, there is nothing like implicit confidence. But never mind that, my boy. Just go and announce your arrival, and let her know all your hopes and prospects. I will go directly, said Edmund, was Edmund's reply and embracing his father and saluting Caderousse, he left the apartment. Caderousse lingered for a moment, then taking leave of old Dantes, he went downstairs to rejoin Danglars, who awaited him at the corner of the Rue Senac. Well, said Danglar, did you see him? I have just left him, answered Caderousse. Did he allude to his hope of being captain? He spoke of it as a thing already decided. Patience, said Danglars. He is in too much hurry, it appears to me. Why, it seems Monsieur Morel has promised him the thing. So that he is quite elated about it. That is to say, he is actually insolent on the matter, has already offered me his patronage, as if he were a grand personage, and offered me a loan of money, as though he were a banker. Which you refused? Most assuredly. Though I might easily have accepted for it was I who put into his hands the first silver he ever earned. But now Monsieur Dantes has no longer any occasion for assistance. He is about to become a captain. Pooh, said Danglars. He is not one yet. Ma foi, and it will be as well he never should be, answered Caldrousse. For if he should be, there would be really no speaking to him. If we choose, replied Danglars, he will remain what he is, and perhaps become even less than he is. What do you mean? Nothing. I was speaking to myself. And is he still in love with the Catalan girl? Over head and ears. But unless I am much mistaken, there will be a storm in that quarter. Explain yourself. Why should I? It is more important than you think, perhaps. You do not like Danglar? Or you do not like Dantes? I never like upstarts. Then tell me all you know relative to the Catalan girl. I know nothing for certain, only I have seen things which lead me to believe, as I told you, that the future captain will find some annoyance in the environ of the Vie Infirmerie. What do you mean? Come tell me. Well, every time I have seen Mercedes come into the city, she has been accompanied by a tall, strapping, black-eyed Catalan with a red complexion, brown skin, and fierce air, whom she calls cousin. Really? And you think this cousin pays her attentions? I only suppose so. What else can a strapping lad of twenty-one mean with a fine wench of seventeen? And you say Dantes has gone to the Catalans? He went before I came down. 
let us go the same way. We will stop at La Reserve, and we can get a glass of La Malague while we wait for news. Come along, said Caderousse, but mind you pay the shot. Certainly, replied Danglars, and going quickly to the spot alluded to, they called for a bottle of wine and two glasses. Père Pamphile had seen Dantes pass not ten minutes before, so assured that he was in the Catalan, they sat down under the budding foliage of the plains and sycamores, in the branches of which the birds were joyously singing on a lovely day in early spring. And that concludes chapters one and two of the Count of Monte Cristo. Thank you again for joining me today. Um, we have a long way to go and it's going to be wonderful. I mean, every step of the way, it's gonna be great. So thank you for joining me. Tomorrow we'll read some more from the Count of Monte Cristo. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I hope it's filled with tea, happiness, and lots of great books. See you tomorrow. Bye.